our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to a special CUBE Conversation here in Palo Alto, the CUBE Studios. I'm John Furrier, your host. We're here with a special panel talking about the new brand of tech leaders in this era of cloud computing, data, AI, and engineering excellence. Um, with us, we have Christine Heckart, the CEO of Scalar, JP Krishna of Marthmorthy, SVP of Engineering at Copa Software, and Pavna Singh, VP of Engineering at Glassdoor. Guys, welcome to come to the Cube conversation. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Um, engineering, you guys are all running engineering organizations. Uh, you've been a former engineer, now running a big company as a CEO, engineering led company. This is a big trend that's clearly defined. No one needs any validation. Cloud computing has certainly changed the game. AI is certainly the hottest trend with respect to data, machine learning, and the benefits there. Changing the cultures of companies, changing how things are built, how people are hired, you're starting to see a complete shift towards old way and new way. So I want to get your thoughts about the engineering opportunities. What does engineering excellence today mean in this modern era? Well, for us, it, we talk a lot about mastery um, and setting up an environment where engineers have a chance to build their own mastery, um, but they can also have the necessary tools and technologies to be master of their domain. And these domains, especially if it's cloud-based, they're very distributed, they're very, very fast moving, there's a lot of continual risk. Um, so you have to set them up in the right way so they can be successful. Pop, now what's your thoughts? I mean, you guys are cutting edge startup. Yes, um, for us, it, it's very important that the environment, the working environment for engineers is organically inspiring. And what I mean by that is when every engineer knows why are they, why, what are they doing, and how their work is impacting the company and the business initiatives. At the same time, we are making sure that their interests are aligned with our projects and work in a way that we are also, in a healthy way, extending and, and stretching their skills. When their work has a purpose, and that's what our mission is, which is we want to make sure that everybody finds an opportunity where they feel there's a purpose, uh, it's purpose driven, that's when we feel like it, that's a great environment where they will be inspired to come every day and deliver their 110%. JP, excellence in engineering. I mean, this is what people strive for. So, excellent points from uh, both of them. And I, I think I have a slightly different take on it as well. Today's businesses, we, we are asked to respond really, really fast. We, we hear the term agile everywhere, John, right? So it's about how do we respond to the needs of the business as quickly as we can and it becomes the mantra for the organization. Having said that, there is another side to it. The, the dark side is technical debt. Uh, that's something we all have to um, grapple with because you're moving fast, you're making decisions, you're hoping things are right, and you want to prove your um, thesis out there, but at the same time, you don't want to put yourself behind so that you, it might come and bite you later. So it's finding that balance is really, really important and that becomes the focal point of the organization. How do you move fast, but at the same time, how do you, how, how do you not slow yourself down in the future? That's a great point. I want to get probably your thoughts on this because open source has been uh, really a different game changer from the old way to the new way because you can work with people from different companies. Absolutely. You can work on projects that are going to be the betterment for other people as well, so it's got a communal aspect to it. But also, there is an element of speed. At the same time, agile, forces this kind of concept. So technical debt, you want to move fast, but you got to recover. You got to kind of know how to get there. How has open source changed that in your opinion? Well, f number one thing that open source allows all uh, smaller companies especially, but more companies, is that now you, are, you can take on an open source project and start, rather than starting from ground zero, you can start somewhere where you know, it's already helped and you have a framework ready to start working on. So you're not, every single time you're building or thinking of a new idea, you're not starting, okay, now let me go start from ground up, right? So you already are at, at a certain level. The second area where, like you said, you know, we are agile, uh, we have open source, but we are also have certain level of customization that the customer is needed or application needs. And that's what inspires engineers as well, which is, taking the challenge of, okay, we have a code base, now let me build something more interesting, more innovative, and then what they also love is giving back to the community. It's, we are not, so the companies are not just tech community and engineering team. We are have a bigger engineering community now, the whole tech world. 
And that's what makes a big difference for us working in Silicon Valley to even be part of that and contributing back to the to the community. JP, talk about technical debt when it comes back to in the modern era because you can go back to, um, yeah, it's been around for a while, technical debt concept is not yes. new, but it's always been kind of the, the water cooler conversation with the, maybe the core lead engineer and the team. The OSCs have a term called feature creeping. You know, That's the right. old days, oh, don't get into feature creep. Agile kind of takes that away because if, you, if you're applying technical debt properly, you're managing the, the velocity of the project. So the question is, how has technical debt evolved to the management levels of, of senior uh, engineering managers? Because that seems to be a key va uh, variable in managing the speed and quality of the teams with managing the technical debt. It's now a management issue. What are some of the conversations? So again, depends on the stage of the company and, and the stage of the projects you're in. If you're in a really mature software environment where you're not making a lot of change, it's okay. It's, it's not the primary conversation of the topic. But if you're trying to you know, capture a market or, or to prove out an idea, it becomes the, the fundamental thesis for getting things out there quickly. Now getting things out there quickly doesn't mean you, you get to let uh, users suffer. right? You have to build it in the right way needs to work, but at the same time, it needs to be just enough so that we can we can get the feedback from, from the users. And at the same time, you probably would have left out potentially features, and maybe you didn't even make uh, certain decisions on let's say high availability or, or scalability. Maybe you want to prove it out in only one region of the world and so on. So you have to find those balances, and it becomes part of the planning uh, conversations right in the front. And as you go into the further iterations of the product, it becomes part of the prioritization conversation with the product managers. Yep. Because it's not just about getting one part done and getting it out there, but as it reaches the full level of maturity that you would want. I'm sure there's a lot of debates about in the engineering organizations. Because you know, engineers are very vocal, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. So you could fall in love with your product if, you're, if it's a time to market, maybe taking some technical debt to get product market fit. And my, my, that's my baby though, and you got to re-platform or rescale it to make it scale, bring them to your points you mentioned. How, how do you guys manage that? Because this becomes a, a talent management. Some people say, oh, you got to manage the ecos, but if some people are managing the projects and they're, they're going too far out over their skis on technical debt, you got to kind of rein that in. How do you guys manage the, the people side of the equation then? Because it's an art and a science at the Absolutely. same time. What's your thoughts? Well, I'll say this. Um, Supporting all, all aspects of change, right? That's also, a, as an engineering leader, it's a, it's a core responsibility and, and a, call it priority for us. Um, not just uh, the technical debt, but also the market shifts, technology shifts. We have new tech coming in, we, have, we are involving and, and evolving every technology. So how do we adhere to and, and make sure that it's very important that engineering is supporting and kind of uh, coming up with these technologies uh, at the same time, we are not just pulling down to their version upgrades and all of that. So, um, to, to in a just, it's it's a core aspect of leadership to make sure that you, as we are supporting these changes, we are also making sure that uh, these changes are not pulling us down. So there should be proper quality checks. There should be proper conversation and roadmap items, which is saying that it's not a tech debt, it's more of a tech investment. And we are talking about so that we are in lock steps with our business partner and not behind. So that now we are saying, okay, we need a whole quarter to develop new things. So awesome. it, it's an aspect of you know, making sure a team is motivated. So this comes back to culture. The next question I want to get you guys' thoughts on is, building a positive work culture um, you have an engineering-led organization. Christine, you're leading that now. It's a startup. You guys are growing real fast. A lot of you got a lot of engineers there, so probably a lot of opinions on what that looks like. What is the culture equation? Because this sets the DNA early on for startup. But as you have a maturing organization, you got to attract the best talent. And some say, "Well, we work on we solve hard problems." That's kind of the cliche, but ultimately you do have to kind of have that the problem-solving aspect. But you got to have a culture. What is a successful work culture for engineering? So every, you know, everybody talks about engineers want to solve hard problems, and I think that's true, but as Pavna said earlier, if you can help every engineer connect what they're doing every day to the higher purpose of the organization, to the problem that you're solving, and how that makes the customer's life better. In our case, we're a company by engineers for engineers, so our engineers get really excited about giving other engineers in the world a better day. We have taken it one step further recently by starting a peer network 
because one of my observations um, coming into this organization is there are so many peer networks in IT because it's been a 30-year industry. There are tons of peer organizations for CEOs. There are tons of peer organizations for CMOs, but there really aren't for engineers. And if we want to help engineers really develop their career and their full skill set and therefore develop into their full potential, it's about more than just training them. It's about giving them context and full social skills and giving them places where they can learn not just from the other engineers in their company but from engineers across the organization or across the industry at their same level and maybe from very different industries and maybe in very different environments so i think in our case you know really trying to bring these peer networks together has been one way that we can not only pay it forward for our own engineers but also help a lot of other engineers around uh, the industry how are you guys handling the engineering talent, retaining, attracting, and keeping the best talent? So I think that's where the whole company comes together, in my view. So as an engineering leader, it's not just that I set the tone of my engineering org as to what that hiring is top priority. It's where the whole company comes together. Your recruiting team to build a stellar uh, interview process. Your um, you know, heads of other uh, orgs to make sure that across the board you're helping define a, uh, a mission for your company that resonates with your candidates who would want to work with you. So it's a collective effort of building a stellar environment. For us, Glassdoor, when, one of the few values is transparency. And we live and die by it, which means that when someone is hired, they need to see that we, within the company we are transparent. So we share a lot of data, a lot of information, good and bad, with every single person in the company. It's never um, hidden. At the same time, we build and s set that trust in them to say, okay, it's confidential. Make sure that it doesn't leave the company. And it's been 11 years, and it has it has never been the case. Well, glass door. You don't want to have a glass door entry on glass door. <laughs> you got to be transparent. That's that for your true. culture. That is true. And culture matters. I mean, it's your culture is Absolutely. all about That's sharing true. and being open. Y you will see. So the re what this is what Glassdoor stands by for as well, right? Building transparency within the company culture. Right. And um, more and more, as we see many stories that we have uh, seen from various companies, and sometimes I, I get a bad story too, and I, I get an invitation. Oh, you're gla from Glassdoor. Um, you, you know, uh, but that helps. Overall, we are living and working for users and professionals. Trust is big for you guys. Absolutely. Professionals who are in this world looking for a job and life because you're spending a lot of time at work. So I, we want you to get up every day and be inspired and happy about where you're going to work. And for that, that's why we are sharing a lot of in, in, uh, insights about the companies from reviews and ratings and CEO data to make sure that when you make your decision of the next move, you, are f you can be fully trust, you can be fully confident that the data we are sharing with you, with that, you're making a good decision. JP, your thoughts, you guys are on a tear. We've got a great coverage of your uh, annual conference in Vegas, recent CUBE coverage. Your company, on paper, looks like you're targeting one segment, but you have a lot of range in your technical platform with data. Um, how are you guys articulating to engineering? How do you keep them? What are some of the, um, uh, stories you tell them to attract them to join you guys? So, um, number one thing is about uh, the talent that we already have in-house. So, people want to come to work uh, at a place where they can learn, contribute, and um, also uh, further career, uh, career as well, both inside Coupa and, and as they leave. And coming into Coupa, they look at it and they say, oh, you have a, a wide variety of things going on here. You're solving a business problem, but at the same time, the technology stacks are different. You, you are on uh, all the best clouds out there. So it, it, that's an easy attraction for them to come in. But also, it's not just about getting people in. How do you retain them? And we've been lucky that um, we had very low attrition uh, for many years right now in the engineering organization, especially in the Valley. It, it is a big deal. And I, I think part of the things that drives that is the, the collaboration and the cooperation that they get from everybody. And you know it's an age-old saying: diversity in thought, mm -hmm. unity in action. Right. So I really promote uh, people thinking about various ideas and alternatives. But there is a time for that debate. And once we ag agree on a solution, we all uh, pull in and try to make that successful. And then you repeat that often, and it becomes the part a part of the culture and, and, and the way the organization operates. As a follow-up to culture, one thing that's become pretty clear is that's global mm -hmm. engineering. Um, you mentioned the Valley, very competitive. Some startups, if they get on that rocket ship, can get all the great talent. You know, you public, everyone, everyone gets rich, everyone's happy, a good mission behind it, you know, win-win. 
outside, some startups have to attract talent. You've got a startup going on here, you might have a good kernel of great engineers, but you have development environments all over the world, so remote is a big thing. It is. How do you manage the engineering with remote? Is it time zone based? Does it put leaders in charge? Is there a philosophy? I know Amazon has a you know two pizza team is their big thing. You know, get small groups. How do you guys view the engineering makeup? Because this becomes a part of the operational tension, but operating model of engineering. Thoughts? Uh, I, I can go first. I, I think there is a tension between uh, keeping teams uh, working on one problem and not distributing it across the world for efficiency reasons. But at the same time, how do you allow for continuity? Uh, especially if you have a problem in one area, can somebody else from another region step in in a different time zone uh, and, and continue on that problem? So that's always a problem. And then the other one is in, in, a, in a landscape like ours, in which is not uncommon for many, many companies, it is not that they built a lot of fragmented things. They all need to work together. So having a level of continuity within the various remote centers is really critical. And everybody has their own recipe for this one. But the ones that works for us, and I've seen that played out many times, is if you can get a set of teams to focus on certain problem areas and become experts in those. Or cohesive within their within the teamwork, team. physical space. And then also have enough critical mass within a center that gives you the good balance between um, you know, working on one thing versus knowing everything. So, so that works for us, and I, I think that's that's the way to kind go. Kind of sounds like an operating system. It, it, it is. Kind it of truly decouple, is. highly cohesive. And, and you need to have the right technical yeah. leaders. I mean, on on both sides, and be willing to collaborate. Uh, with, with each other. Pop the thoughts. I, I, I want to emphasize on the last statement. You really need strong, good, really uh, you know trusted uh, leaders in the location to kind of then inculcate more bigger team and everything. Uh, Glassdoor uh, grew from one location to four locations in last three years. And one thing that we uh, learned after our first uh, remote location that we started was that when we seeded our new remote location with few people from the original location, that helped start you know, the similar aspects of what Glassdoor stands for and our core ethos and values. And then as we added new people, they just kind of easily it just transferred to them. So that helped us in a big way. And then we moved to Chicago with the same idea, and of course Brazil now with the same idea. So Constant. knowledge transfer, culture transfer, Makes it all makes it easy when you have few people seating from the original location. That was core for us. P Pavna actually started their first remote office in San Francisco, which has now become their headquarters, so she has a lot of experience. Yes. Um, every you, one of Christine. Scalar's customers globally, you know, we sell yes. to engineers, so um, we're dealing yeah. with, with our customers who are dealing with this problem all the time. And in addition to culture, one thing that seems to bubble up regularly is can do you know when they need a common tool set and where they can do their own thing? Yeah. How do you, you know, balance that? And where do you need a single source of truth that people can agree on? And again, where can people have different points of view? You're talking single sources from code base to what? Could, could be whatever. Logs? Like in our Technology. case, it's, yeah, if you're going to troubleshoot something, you know, where are the logs, the truths yeah. in the logs? Yeah. Are you going to have a single source for that? Um, but for other people, it could be the data that they're bringing in or how they analyze the business. But if you can be proactive about understanding when is commonality of tools, of approach, of philosophy, of data, whatever, when is commonality? going to be what we drive, and when are we going to allow people to do their own thing. And if you can put that framework in place, then people know when they have the latitude and when they got to yeah. snap to grid. And you can move a lot more quickly, and there's kind of a technical debt um, that isn't code-based, it's more about this kind of stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. It's tool-based, it's process and culture-based, and if you can be more proactive about avoiding that debt, then you're going to move more quickly over well, time. And the this video conferencing, very very important. You know, you should be able to jump on a video conference very easily to be able to connect with mm -hmm. someone rather than just a phone call. So yes. all of these yeah. FaceTime, different ways of FaceTime. Technology yeah. plays a big role. Technology yeah. and, and this is this is a modern management challenge for the new way yeah. to lead because it used to be just outsource. Here's the specs. Remember the old PRDs and MRDs? Here's the specs and you just kind of build it. Now it's much more collaborative to your yeah. point. There's real product and engineering going right. on. Yeah. And it's got to be, it's evolving. Yes. This is a key new ingredient. Because yeah. the expectation on the quality of product is so much more higher. The right. competition is so much more higher. Yeah. And when you know these engineers build it, in a lot of cases they have to operate it now. 
So, um, like you say, whether it's a free service to a consumer yes. or it's an enterprise, the expectation is perfect. Yes. No downtime, no hiccups. Yeah. And the and reward incentives now become a big part of this now, new way of doing things. So I got to ask the natural question, what's the reward system? Because you know Google really kind of pioneered the idea of, oh, spend 20% of your time, work on your own projects. That was, what, a decade or so ago. Now it's evolved beyond that to free lunches and all these other perks. But this, it's got to appeal to the, to the human being behind it. What are some of the reward um, mechanisms that you guys see as management that's, that's helpful in growing, nurturing, and scaling up engineering organizations? Well, engineers are human, and as every human, autonomy is critical for any aspects of motivation, and that's what plays at the core level. And of course, uh, lunches matter, and uh, other perks and benefits matter, snacks, of course, good coffee machine definitely is the core of it. Yeah. But uh, autonomy of what you want to do, and is it aligned with what we want, or what we are trying to deliver, and the aspect, and the information of I did and rolled this out, what was the impact of it? That news should go back to that engineer who built that. So threading it through to the end and from the start is very core for everybody to know because I want to know what I'm, as I'm going every day, how is it helping? And we really try, I personally try to make sure that each human on the team, regardless of their function, that we understand um, their potential and their career mm -hmm. aspirations. Because a lot of times the, the normal ladder, whatever that ladder is, might not be right for every person. And, and people can pivot and use their skills in very, very different ways. And we need to invest in their ability to try new things. And if it doesn't work out, let them come back. So you know, we try to spend time as a company for engineers, not just in our company, but beyond, um, to really help them build out their own career and, and build out their own brands. Engineers more and more can be you know, on TV shows and doing blogs and building out their own personal brand and their point of view and that gives them impact that goes beyond the one piece of code that they're writing for a company in a given day or week. JP, you guys went public, stock options, all these things are going on as well. Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I just came back from a trip to my newest uh, dev center in uh, Hyderabad, India. It's funny, I, I, I had sessions with every team out there. The number one topic was food. <laughs> they were so excited about food. So there is something uh, you know, uh, about primal food. about yeah. food. Uh, having said that, I think uh, praise and recognition, uh, the age old things, they matter so much. That's what I've seen. Uh, when, when you acknowledge what somebody has done and kind of feed back to like Pafna was saying, the impact that it creates, um, you know, it's it's a lot more fulfilling yeah. than, than monetary incentives. Not that they are not useful, uh, you know, occasionally they are, but I think uh, repeating that and, and doing it more often creates a sense of, okay, here's what we can accomplish as a team, here is how I can contribute to it, and that creates an overall sense of purpose. Awesome, you guys talked about tools as a commonality is kind of key. There's always going to be debates about which tools, which codes, uh, languages to use in coding, et cetera. But this brings up the notion of application development. As you get continuous development, this is the operating model for modern engineering. Mm -hmm. What's the state of the art? What are you guys seeing as a best practice as managers to keep the machinery humming and moving along? And what, what's on the horizon? What's next? Yeah, you know, I, I, in my view, I would just say, so what's humming and, and what's state of the art? I think AI is core to uh, most of the systems and applications. The, uh, the core aspect of pretty much every company, as you see, and that's the buzzword even in Silicon Valley, for the right reasons, is how we have built our platforms and systems and ideas, but now let's make it smarter. And every company now has a lot of data. We are swimming in data. But it's very important that we can pick and pull the, the core insights from that data to then power the same product and same system to make it more uh, smarter, right? The whole goal for us uh, ourselves is we are, we are making our platform more smarter with the goal of making it more personalized and making sure that as users are, are navigating our, project, our, our pages, they are seeing more personalized information so that they're not wasting their time. There we can make faster decisions in, in more uh, rich data set, which is very catered towards them. So, smart, uh, so building that intelligence is core. And with continuous integration comes continuous risk. Oh, right? yes. So Absolutely. no risk, no reward. And so we live in an era of freemium, free services. So 
you know, why not take the risk? You don't have to do an A-B test. You got digital, you can do A, B, C, D, and use all kinds of analytics. So this is actually a creative opportunity for engineering as they get to the front lines, you mentioned earlier, getting part of the empowerment. Yeah. How is the risk taking changing the management? You know, I deal with a, a class of users who are willing to pay money. <laughs> so I don't know if I can talk a lot about the premium aspect of the problem. But uh, you know, there is always desire for new functionality, if you want it. Otherwise, you don't want it, right? There, there is a lot of risk averseness that's still floating around, especially in the enterprise uh, uh, out there today. And it, it is a big tension that you have to deal with. And if you are not careful, then you can introduce problems. And today, when you're operating on the cloud and you're servicing thousands of customers, a small change can bring down the, the entire ecosystem. So you have to take it very seriously. You're helping others run their business. And that means you have to invest in the right tools and processes. In so house. you guys, I mean obviously a premium business model, but still engineers got to test stuff. They want to take Absolutely. the risks. So is it a cloud sandboxing? How is the risk taking um, uh, managed? Yeah. How are you guys encouraging risk without you're having people hurt themselves. Yeah, so you, you don't want to overburden engineers yeah. to the point they, they feel stifled and they cannot do anything. So you, there is a right balance. So, um, you know, there are many techniques we follow. We, we, uh, for example, we, we roll out the software to a staging environment so customers can play around and make sure things are not breaking uh, for their comfort more so than for us. But it is an important part of the equation. And then internally, you have to invest a lot in planning appropriately. Uh, there are the high risk uh, content and the features, and then there are the low risk ones. You want to think about um, experimentation frameworks, you know, A-B testing and yep. so on. And more importantly about automation and testing. I, I don't think if, if a customer logs a bug and finds that problem, they don't want to see it one more time ever, yeah. right? Yeah. So you really have to make sure that those things don't happen, and you have to invest in uh, robust uh, automation around uh, testing processes, because there isn't enough time uh, for the complexity of these applications to test anything manually. This is where automation with the cloud oh, comes yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Containers, uh, Kubernetes, th all, all of those things. You know, you had to enable engineers with the technology set so that they can test at scale. Um, you had to provide access to production-like data because you had to worry about um, you know, privacy, security, yeah. and all those aspects. But at the same time, they need to have access to uh, the variety of uh, configurations that are out there so that they can test it meaningfully. So you have to invest in all of those things. But I'll take it back to kind of where we started this, which is the human factor. Um, with continuous delivery is this continuous risk. And it doesn't matter if this engineer is supporting a free consumer application or the highest end of enterprise. When something goes wrong, this, their stress level goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, how can we equip these people to solve problems in real time, to have that visibility, to have whatever tool set or data or whatever they need, because at the end of the day, a bad day for an engineer is a day when something is breaking and they're the ones that have to stay up all night and fix it. And a good day for an engineer, a human being, is the day they get to go home and have dinner with the family. Um, or not be woken up in the middle of the night, and there is <laughs> or kite surfing or whatever they do. <laughs> yeah, whatever they do, the but there's do. you know there is truly a human. Yeah. You know, we think about engineers, and engineers get up every day and they want to change the world and they want to make an impact. And thank God we have, you know, teams of engineers that do that for all of us. Um, and they're human beings, and there's a level of yeah. continuous stress that we've injected into their lives every yeah. day. Um, and to the extent that we as companies and managers and leaders can help take some of that burden yeah. off of them, the world becomes a better and place, Pablo's they can do their job. talking about the whole being, seeing the results of their work too, yeah. right. is, is rewarding as well. Yeah. Right. And All Scalar right. does a lot of stuff there, so I have to call that out. <laughs> At the same time, you know, a lot of very good nuggets uh, JP brought up, but one more thing that has shifted in terms of how a, a process or practice works is more and more engineers now participate very early on in That's product right. development yes. phase and they, they try to understand what is the context and why are we doing, and the, we do a lot of user research to understand the, that yeah. process so that they have full context that they are building and developing. Uh, so they are more of a partner now and not an afterthought. I think Agile and DevOps to me has proven that the notion of silos yeah. and waterfall practices has democratized and flattened the organizations out where interdisciplinary crossovers are happening. Oh yes. And this has been an interesting uh, art in, uh, of management is 
encouraging the right person to cross over the right line. In other words, you give people a little taste, but sometimes they may not belong there. You got to kind of, they used to call it herding cats in the old days, but now it's more of managing kind of interests mm -hmm. and growth areas. Yes. That original DevOps model, though, um, if you if anybody read the Phoenix Project like years ago, but it's it was really about bringing different points of view. It's a diversity mm -hmm. thing. It's bringing mm -hmm. different points of view around the table before the first line of code That's is right. written so that you're thinking about every angle on the problem and on the ongoing operation of whatever you're building. Well, let's talk about diversity and inclusion and diversity. I always like to say it's inclusion and diversity, not diversity and inclusion because male and females are involved. We have two females in tech here. This has been a discussion. We still don't have the numbers up that, to the senior levels within engineering in general. What has to happen to move the needle for women in tech and or inclusionary uh, uh, people involved in engineering to get the right perspectives? What's, what's needed? I'd start with JP, because he's JP. actually a huge champion, and without the men involved, we don't have a solution. Mm -hmm. so. Inclusion and diversity. JP, your thoughts on this, because it's super important. Yeah, uh, number one is recognition, in my opinion, John. Um, I mean, I, I was telling uh, Christine yesterday, I just came back from India, as I told you, took a picture out there of my management team, came back here, looked at it, there is no female on the, on the thing, no woman, right? It, it's crazy, I mean, it's not that we are not trying, and um, it, it, we had the same problem when we started our center in 2015, right? Uh, there was a group picture of the team, there, was, like, there were like two women on, on the thing. We put a lot of effort into it, and two years later, you know, a significant chunk of the organization has got, uh, you know, women embedded in the teams. And it came because we tried. Uh, we went out, um, looked for those who, um, who are good in this area. It's not that we compromised on, on on the qualifications. It's really about putting some energy into getting the right resumes and then uh, and looking at it. The other thing we are also doing is cultivation. Um, you have to go to the grassroots because there aren't just enough women engineers. It's unfortunate. Um, for whatever reasons, they are not taking up uh, that profession. I mean, there are enough studies written on it. So last two years, we, uh, we have conducted something called Rails Girls in India. 150 you know, school-age children, women, I mean, girls come in and then we have supported them, um, you know, uh, run their classes, whole-day classes, um, and that helps. You know, even if 10% of them, you know, choose to take up this profession, it's going to be a big boost. Yeah. And we have to do a lot more of those, in my opinion. Pavna, you're a senior vice president leading engineering. What's your view? Well, I'll say this, um, you know, for the people who are participating and helping drive this mission, just like JP, I say thank you. Especially for men who are participating in it, we cannot do this without you. Uh, but uh, for all the people who are, if they're not participating, participating and helping drive this mission, I, I, I have, I'll share this one data. Uh, one of the initiatives that Glassdoor drives is gender pay gap, which is also an outcome of not having diverse um, outlook at all levels in the, in the workplace. And we, in our economic research team, they did a study and they shared a, a, a projection of when will we close the gender pay gap. It's 2017. That's depressing. Yeah. So for, for me, when I hear people who say, uh, you know, they don't want to participate or they don't think this is the right approach of solving for diversity in workplace, I say, okay. But that's not the reason for you to not participate and stay out of it. Join it, join it in your own way. But it's only when all of us kind of see it as a real problem and participate just like JP, as you said, grassroots level as well as outside. One of the example that I tell my team when they say, uh, you know, we don't want to drop the bar, the quality bar, I say, sure, don't drive it, but don't drop it. But if you have two candidates, one with a diverse background, um, who, who might be uh, applicable to the same job in two to three months over someone who's slam dunk today, let's invest in the person who is bringing the diverse background for two to three months and then make them successful. That's not dropping the bar, that's still supporting and investing in, yeah. in helping the diversity. My good friend Inhi Chusa at IBM, they put out a survey that said, diversity, inclusion and diversity first companies have a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So the investment isn't so much about lowering the bar, it's more Absolutely. of bringing a perspective because it, we're talking about software here. Absolutely. Software has male and female, and That's the audiences are not 17% female. It's Absolutely. <laughs> but so it's not just, you know, I add two things to the comments, all of which I agree with. One, it's not just a pipeline problem. It is a 
a culture problem where people have to feel welcome mm -hmm. and it has to be a comfortable environment and they have to believe that their diverse point of view matters. And it doesn't matter if they're men or women. Yeah. Um, but there are lots of times when we all make it hard for somebody with a different point of view to enter the conversation. So we have to do a better job of creating the culture. Um, and secondly, there's a saying, you have to see it to be it. Mm -hmm. We have to see people of diversity, gender and of every other type, cognitive diversity of all types, at every level in the company. And you know, we had the same thing, so I'm lucky enough to sit on Fortune 500 Public Board, and I spend a lot of my time helping women um, and people of color and diversity get on public boards. But if you go back seven years ago, we were 14% women on public boards, and it did not move, right. and it did not move, and it did not move, and in one year it popped over 20%, and that's before the loss. So, you know, you make these linear projections. We can, with effort, yes. actually make Absolutely. a difference. It just takes a very concerted effort. And in this case, yeah. particularly for engineering and for leadership, it is making a concerted effort at every level from board to CEO to executive team to all levels down, making sure we have inclusion and diversity yeah. um, in This in is a ranks. modern uh, management challenge in the new way of yeah. leading, mm -hmm. managing totally. this process. This is the is, big is, challenge. This is the big challenge. Folks, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Final question for you guys is, what is if you could summarize the um, new way to lead in this modern era, from an engineering standpoint, building out a company, building a long, durable value creation, whether it's company or product or service, what is the key keys to success? As a leader? As a leader, as a new brand of leaders. I would say, you know, this lot goes into, I, I'm sure you need to know engineering and all this, the strategic aspect of your job, but the core aspect I feel is, as a leader, my success depends on the quality of relationships I'm building with my team and, and members that I work with. So that goes into pe the people aspect, the people connection that goes into it. JP, your thoughts? Absolutely, people are, are a big portion of the story. Uh, I also feel um, understanding the problem and driving for results. You know, it's not just about building something, it's about building for a purpose. What is it that you are, uh, you are trying to accomplish? And continuing to uh, refine that and working with the teams is, is so critical for success, especially in a fast moving environment. Christine? Yeah, I uh, agree, it is all about the people and I think old and new, this hasn't changed. People need to feel like they belong and they're being appreciated and they're being heard. Scaler, Glassdoor, Copa Software, you guys are doing great work. Thanks for sharing the engineering inputs to leading and successful companies. Thank you, this John. This new this era of leadership. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, John. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.